Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. Hey guys, welcome to episode 29 of the Wingman Podcast. And today I have on Kevin Estella from Fieldcraft Survival. You might be wondering, okay, why field, why survival? Why a survival guy? This is a wing shooting podcast. Well, I want you to think about every fall. Unfortunately, we hear about hunters that go out in the field, especially duck hunters, it seems like, go out in the field and they don't come home and they may or may not find their bodies. We had to deal with that. Um, the whole duck hunting community was following along with some of that stuff this year. And it's heartbreaking and it can be, while accidents necessarily can't be avoided, they can be planned for a little bit better. And Kevin's going to talk us through some of those things that we might, that we might think about better as hunters. I know I am guilty of always planning for the safety of my dog, but not necessarily for my own personal safety. And I have little kids and a wife at home that really like to see me pull in the driveway at the end of the day and in full health so we're gonna walk through some of that stuff kevin thanks for being on i really appreciate your time and i think we got our technological difficulties figured out here you just made a big move man you were from new hampshire and you're no, out Connect Connecticut. Connecticut. sorry sorry yeah i trust me i'd rather say that i were from new hampshire uh, than connecticut <laughs> But yeah, East Coast nonetheless. But you're in Utah now, correct? Yes, I am. Awesome. And Kevin, tell us what it is you do at Fieldcraft. We know you're the director of training, but what does that entail? What did you do prior to that? Give us some of your experience and let's talk about who Kevin Estella is. Yeah, so uh, so I'm technically the director of training at Fieldcraft Survival on the non-firearms related side. So I'm not teaching the tactical carbine courses, the gunfighter pistol courses, our uh, precision class uh, with precision rifle, but I do run the courses that relate to survival, uh, hunting, trapping, fishing, land navigation, medical courses, and I occasionally help out with our mobility uh, courses that relate to like bug out vehicles and overlanding. Oh, cool. Uh, th that's technically my, my title at Fieldcraft Survival, but everyone at Fieldcraft Survival has many different hats that they wear. Sure. So in addition to working as a training director, I'm helping out with uh, collaborations with some of the, the bigger companies that are out there that we're going to be working with this year. I'm producing content, recording videos, writing articles. I'm talking to customers when they walk into our retail store in Heber. So we, we all do a lot. Like this morning, I was just unpacking a truck at one of our, our storage facilities. So we, we all help out. Um, and everyone at the company is essentially a, a multi-tool, right? We all have a lot of different functions that we do. Prior to Fieldcraft Survival, I worked as a public uh, education uh, history teacher. I worked for uh, 14 years at Bristol Central High School teaching everything from world history to uh, modern American history to all the AP courses. And along the way, like over those 14 years, I also worked summers and anytime I had off as a survival instructor with my company, which was Estella Wilderness Education. And before that, I was the lead survival instructor at the Wilderness Learning Center, north of the Adirondacks, literally on the US-Canada border. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so when people talk about cold, I say, well, cold's a relative term. We talk yep. in like Connecticut cold or Canadian border cold. Um, yep, no, I hear you. I hear yeah. you. I was, I was at a high school and middle school English teacher and, and various coach for a long time, over a decade. So I feel you there, man, as far as working different jobs in the summers, done it, yeah. done it, done it. So yeah. I, and I, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. And, and I was going to say like, uh, it's definitely prepared me for working at Fieldcraft. I feel uh, a lot of the guys are, appreciate the fact that I bring that education component because that's ultimately our goal. I mean, people know us as a media company. They know us as a company that, that puts out some pretty, pretty cool content. But our goal at the end of the day with Fieldcraft Survival is to educate sportsmen, outdoorsmen, uh, those who are interested in the, the safety and the well-being of their families. Uh, we want to educate them to make the best decisions possible to be the most ready. I love that. And that, that is exactly what we are. That is a big part of our mission statement here at Eastman's and especially wingmen is educate and entertain 
educate first. If we can help you go in the field and have a better experience and be overall, be a better hunter. That's what it's all about. And then edge and entertaining along with that. If you're not entertained, what you're not having any fun. So, I mean, you got to have fun with it too, but well, that is cool, man. I appreciate the, the little bit of background, but so I think about, I wrote, I wrote an article, I think it was a four piece series, four part series a couple years ago on extreme conditions, dog safety, completely mm -hmm. focused on the dangers surrounding waterfowl hunting dogs, ducks and geese in the late season when there's extreme temperatures, there's ice, there's snow. A lot of times in the West, we're hunting fast moving rivers. Um, those seasons run concurrent with trapping seasons. So there's traps and snares and things, lots of stuff, everything from hypothermia to hypoglycemia to figuring out and knowing how to get your dog out of a trap in, in, a, in a quick, quick manner. That was to me, that's like a no brainer, right? You got to take care of the dog, take care of the dog. I didn't even, I don't give any thought about what do I need in my hunting kit you know, every waterfowler carries a, a bag with them and it keeps snacks. It has calls. It has ammunition, usually gloves, you know, a handful of things. I just this year started carrying a, a small first aid kit in that because, and I kind of dovetailed it with a first aid kit for my dog that can do double duty almost. What are, what are some of the things that I guess what I'd like to do is take a look at the different aspects of hunting uh, of wing shooting from we'll talk start with waterfall hunters that sometimes guys are in boats, sometimes they're out of a based out of a vehicle on land, sometimes they're walking a long ways in through marshy environments. What are some of the things that people need to be cognizant of in those situations? And more importantly, what are some of the things that guys should be thinking about taking with them on a daily basis to keep them safe? All right, so I haven't had a chance to do any uh, bird hunting out here yet in, in, in Utah. Just I just moved here a couple couple months yeah. ago. Yeah. But I was just out on the water this past week in an ultralight canoe with ice on the water and little pockets of, of open water. And I'll tell you, I mean, a lot of people see open water and they think, okay, the ice is gone, right? The ice is melted off and now I have a chance to go outside and, and embrace the great outdoors. But the combination of cold and uh, and wet and windy, right? Or I should say wet and windy creates one of the worst feelings of cold. Um, I right. think one of the, the most important things for someone who is, uh, you know, constrained to a boat is having some type of bailout kit or having some type of uh, immersion kit. So that's assuming if you do go into the drink, how are you going to rewarm yourself? Okay. Now, I know that space can be very limited inside of, uh, inside of canoes, it can be very limited inside of like little John boats and whatnot, but there's definitely room for a Ziploc bag that you fill with a spare change of uh, insulated underwear, right? Now, if we think about this, let's say you go completely, completely in the drink and you have access to the shoreline. Well, if you can get to the shoreline and if you have your bag, you're probably gonna start stripping your clothes and getting the wet clothes off and trying to think of a way logically to rewarm yourself. Well, if we think of three layers, right? If we think of like an external layer, a middle layer and a skin layer, right? Just think EMS. Uh, if we think external layer, that layer is probably gonna be some type of water resistant shell that won't absorb water, right? So it won't absorb water, but it will block the wind. Sure. That's a great, that's a great option to just tuck away at the side. Remember it's, it's soaking wet, or at least in this case, it's, it's been in the water. Your middle layer is probably going to take the longest to dry out because it's going to be some type of insulation. It could be wool. It could be uh, some type of puffy jacket, whatever it may be. That skin layer, you could probably wring out, but it will still be damp. I believe in carrying a spare base layer that will stay bone dry because if you can completely dry off or rinse off or at least get mostly, say, like uh, like damp, um, you know, touch or damp to the touch skin, like if you were sweating, you could throw on that new base layer that's bone dry and then throw on your shell. Let that middle layer kind of dry off, uh, you know, build a fire if you can. But by having that 
that skin layer in that external layer, you can generate your own body heat by doing jumping jacks, doing push-ups, sure, and you're sure. gonna have a you're gonna have a mostly dry body. Um, so that's gonna that's gonna be one of the keys right there is having some prior preparation before you go into the drink. Um, it doesn't hurt to have chemical hand warmers handy in that immersion kit because as you are you know slowly drying out that stuff, you can crack open those hand warmers and put them underneath your armpits and your groin, uh, put them by your kidneys. So now you have an artificial heat source. There's a lot of things that you could do, um, but you just have to weigh what makes the most sense for you. I mean, if you are most concerned about uh, getting warm, then maybe you're going to want to add in a <clears throat> pair of gloves and, a, and, a, and an extra hat, right? Um, but I believe that starting off with something dry is the first key to, to kind of getting back in front of that power curve um, because cold, cold will ultimately win. You know, if you right. don't do anything about it, when you go on the drink, you, you're, you're going to be in a bad, bad case. So I would say carry an immersion kit, artificial heat source, dry base layer, and have a plan of stripping everything down. There's no, there's no time for modesty, by the way. If you happen to go on your drink and your buddy doesn't, you're getting naked. Uh, and guess what? It doesn't matter what kind of turtle factor we're going to see or anything like that. Like right. it's your life. It's your life or your dignity. Guess what? One's got to, one's got to suffer. I'd rather give up my dignity any day. So, uh, that's, so that's all what I'd recommend. That's interesting that you say that I had, uh, an experience and in the boat guys, it depends on the boat. You know, some guys are, they're running bigger water. They're going to be running a bigger boat. So this is something that you could put a pretty good stash of dry clothes in a dry box in a dry bag in whatever and stash that somewhere in your boat whether it's in a who knows whether it's in a, a locker whether it's in under a seat there are options there's there's ways to do that whether it's just in um some sort of a dry tote you know we use we use the the yeti go boxes all the time they're waterproof i mean they float like they float like crazy. Nothing's going to get in them, and you can stuff a lot of stuff in them. And they're not the only they're not the only option. There are lots of things like that. But I'm thinking already back to the times I hunted big water, and I had a big boat. I had an 18 foot boat, and I could man, I could take a lot of stuff with me. These guys that are running in drift boats in the West or canoes like you said or other personal watercraft they might not have that but i think i think you hit the nail on the head with that where just a little ziploc bag with an extra dry extra set of dry sh a shirt a pair of dry pants and like you said a lot of times your outer layer is not going to soak up a lot of stuff and it will still block the wind right and that's the big factor because i did i had the good fortune to do a a rewarming drill a few years back with uh, John Barklow from Sitka. He's their big, he's one, their big game guy. And he and I jumped on purpose in a half frozen river here in Wyoming on a negative 20 day and bailed out. And he, we ran through the drill that he used to use in training in the armed forces. And it was, it was called the static rewarming drill. It wasn't the dynamic, wasn't dynamic. We weren't doing exercise. We were using warm food, shelter, um, sleeping, dry sleeping bags, and our clothing we were wearing to basically warm ourselves and reheat and dry our clothing. It was amazing how quickly the clothing dried, first of all, and how warm you were able to actually stay. Um, warm liquids, warm food, and you, and basically getting that internal furnace just cranked to the max. So I think that's something too. what, what are your, what's your take on something like that? As far as being prepared with those types of things. Uh, I'm a proponent for carrying a, a thermos. Whenever I go hunting, I always have a, a thermos with me and I've always got, you know, uh, coffee in that just to keep me awake it's usually going to be pretty early <laughs> but um i believe that there's a way of, of maximizing the warm drinks that you put in your body one of my favorite things to have on winter camping trips is hot cocoa with butter and if you think about this one it warms you three or four times right so you have the initial heat of the beverage going down your throat you've got the uh, your body metabolizing the sugar mm -hmm. and you've got your body metabolizing the fat 
right? So that type of that type of drink is something that you can easily put together uh, in the great outdoors. You can carry the butter in a Ziploc bag and add it, you know, later on if you if you really need it, or you can just do the whole thing ahead of time, shake it up, and right. and have like a, a really really nutritious drink. Um, so I, I believe in that. In terms of using your sleeping bag to dry everything and warm everything, it's going to be the most efficient when uh, you sleep in it naked or you sleep in it with just your base layer on because it's it's going to be more efficient at warming that dead airspace than your than your clothing. Right. Um, so that's that's spot on too. I mean, uh, it's just important to remember every morning that you're out in the field with a sleeping bag as much as possible, try to dry it out by leaving it in the sun, try to dry right. it out by, by warming it next to a fire. Just don't melt the outer shell um, because you don't want those internal, uh, the loft of the sleeping bag. You don't want that loft to be compressed with moisture because sure. it will be, it'll feel more, uh, I should say it will feel colder and colder uh, with each day that you don't uh, maintain your gear in the field. Right. Right. And obviously a lot, most wing shooters aren't going to be worried about a sleeping bag. And in that scenario, the, the idea was to get your clothing dry by wearing it dry, basically, because if you took it off, it was going to freeze into a ball and it was going to be unusable. And so it was just being able to stay in the field. So that, that was an interesting thing. But, you know, I think about guys that are, that are walking into places to, I guess it was two years ago, two seasons ago, I we knocked down some birds in the, in the river. I did not have my dog that day. He had a hard day the day before and I was giving him the day off. I thought, well, it'll be all right. We'll go down and we'll we took a buddy and his dog. It's no big deal. Well, we knocked some birds down. His dog's doing work and there's birds getting away down river. I thought oh, I can get that. No big deal. So I go running down the bank and I'm wading out into the river and I'm, I'm reach stretching, stretching, stretching for this goose. And my feet go out from underneath me and I'm in water that's over, over my head and it's February. So it was, I mean, ambient outdoor temp was, you know, below freezing water temp is 33 degrees, 34 degrees. And I've got on, um, Merino base layers. So a synthetic high loft pant underneath my waders, which are my shell. And then I had on. Um, I had a jacket actually, I'd taken my, my jacket was in the, in the blind. I wasn't wearing it at the, at that moment. So it was dry. And I went back, got the bird, by the way, win <laughs> and side stroked it to the bank, got out, you know, once that shot gets over, it's like, all right, well, let's go jump back in the blind. Birds are flying. So we jump, I jumped back in the blind. I made it about three hours after that. And my, I could feel, you know, my core temp was starting to, I was cold and anybody that knows me well, I don't get cold very easily. And I, I had initially, I had immediately gone back and I'd put that jacket on. Well, I got chilled down. I thought, and the birds kind of quit flying. It's like, all right, let's, let's bag it. I walk back up and this is the, I guess the point I'm getting at. We had about a 30 minute walk back to the truck, kind of up, up out of the river bottom, kind of climb a little bit of a hill. By the time I got back to the truck, I was peeling that outer jacket off. I was warm. Mm -hmm. And when I got home, I dumped that, dumped out my waders and the water inside my waders was body temperature. I mean, it was warm and I was warm. I had belt belted on, so I didn't have a lot of water, but what water was in there had warmed up and through exercise but if i guarantee if i'd have stopped i'd have very quickly gotten cold again so what would have been your recommendation if you're say you're out on oh i think about doing like a float hunt or you don't have necessarily the ability you're locked into a certain time period i think about if i'd have been in my drift boat and i'd have had three more hours or four more hours before i could get to my takeout what would I, what should I have done in that scenario? I mean, do I, do I dump the water out? Do I leave it in? Do I try to, you know, what do you think? Well, I mean, it sounds like your waiters sound like they were neoprene, right? Nope. They were a breath. They, they, they were weren't. a breathable waiter from Sitka Gore-Tex. Can you yeah, still they, hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I had someone just calling. That's the, the uh. fun of 
doing uh you know one of these on your phone uh, i hear you so so the thing is like if you have a breathable waiter i mean it's going to it's going to trap some of the water in right like it's gonna they're they're breathable but they're not totally breathable um you're creating essentially like a like a microclimate inside of your waders whether they're neoprene or they're breathable and your body is going to i mean as long as you can get most of the water out like we don't want to look like a like a water balloon right like right but as long as you get most of the water out your body heat is going to be trapped within the layers of that of those waders so i think you just did the right thing i mean you kind of have to tough it out a little bit you get as much out as you can you put that jacket on that jacket is going to keep the it's going to keep the heat from leaving your body, right? It creates right. that micro. So I right. think that's, that's the correct, correct move right there. Um, if now, if you don't have a jacket and you know, you have limited supplies, I mean, we could, what if this uh, a million oh, ways, yeah. but in that scenario, I think you did the right thing because you're trapping in the escaping body heat and, uh, and you're again, at that point, you're in like a race against time, right? Like right. your body, your, your body is only going to produce so much heat. I'm sure once you got done with that, you're probably, you know, hungry enough to eat like, you know, multiple meals um, because your body's work, your body's working in overdrive at that point to metabolize, to stay warm. Um, it depends on who you talk to, but I'm always hungry enough to eat multiple meals. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no. it's like whenever, whenever people say, Oh, are you hungry? It's like, look, do you need me to eat? Cause I can eat. <laughs> that is so true. So true. So Let's look at this from a gear standpoint, then outside of that, that little set of extra clothes, we got to be prepared for accidents out, outside of getting wet, you know, because Correct. in a lot of situations, if you've, if you've, if you're wearing a PFD, if, I mean, accident, like I said, accidents happen, but a lot of times getting wet is just part of duck hunting and in part in part of being water fowler there that's the term water in the name you're gonna get wet at some point whether it's from precipitation or whether it is from sweat from ex from exertion or whether it is from literally falling in the water we hear all the time every fall there's a sad sad stories of guys that go out in boats and they don't come back and they find their bodies weeks later, days later. And I mean, like I said, accidents happen. You hit a log in the dark, you flip your boat, you smack your head. You know, you don't have a lot of control over situations like that, other than trying to be as careful as you possibly can. But say you don't smack your head, say you're, you're in the drink and what could you have done or what do you need to do to be as prepared as possible in a situation like that ahead of time? Because you're, you're, you know, it's, I think about some of these, like on the Mississippi river, for example, a lot of this, it seems like every year something happens on the Mississippi that things like a man eater and boat capsizes you're in the water. And I mean, thinking ahead of time, what do guys need to have thought out and prepared for? One thing that I'd recommend is carry fire every, everywhere you go, every single day, carry fire. Um, I don't leave my house without at least two different ways of making a fire every single day. I have a, a lighter in my left-hand pocket. I have a ferro rod attached to my Swiss army knife in my right-hand pocket. Um, if I were going out in that kind of scenario, I'd also add a candle. Um, if I add a candle and I add even a simple uh, like 55 gallon drum liner, I can create Again, going back to that microclimate, because that's going to be the primary concern. I can get to shore. I can strip off some layers. I can start drying off my clothes. I can light that candle, put it between my legs, sit cross-legged, put that bag over everything. And that simple candle puts out the same amount of BTUs as pretty much the human body, right? Wow. So it's like having, it's like having a, an additional heating source, you know, in, you can get a small four hour candle, which will do a, a good amount of work uh, inside of a, inside of a garbage bag that you can then huddle over. Um, you know, everyone thinks that emergency blankets are the do all end all, but emergency blankets reflect body heat back. They don't generate heat. So that's why having that, that candle and that emergency blanket on your person, right? Like everyone has a, a set of waders with a pocket in the chest, or they have a, a hunting vest that has room for spare shells. Uh, I know people that go big game hunting and they're like, oh, I only carry the rounds in the gun because if I shoot more than that, am I really hunting or am I just, you know, bad, bad shot? So you can find places to carry 
you can find places to carry that extra gear. And I would say carry some type of wind resistant barrier, which could be uh, the 55 gallon drum liner, maybe the 55 gallon drum liner in conjunction with a emergency blanket that will slowly start reflecting the heat back um, and a candle and some type of fire source. But one thing we have to remember is if it's anything like it was this past week here in Utah, when my hands got cold and wet, I had a hard time putting my, my canoe back on my vehicle because I didn't have enough grip strength from losing the, the, the strength of my hands from the cold. So you need to have tools that you can use with, say, I always call them my, my lobster claws. Right. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, flick a, <clears throat> flick a bit because I might not have the dexterity to, but if I have a large ferro rod that I can grab with, with four fingers, right. I can get that thing going pretty easily. Uh, as opposed to like these small miniature kits that are very convenient, but very impractical to use when you, when you have loss of dexterity. So those would be some of the key items um, that I would definitely recommend. Uh, having a source of fire every single day, having a flashlight is another one because chances are, you know, you are probably going to get into some type of scenario when you can't see very well, when your senses are, are taken from you. So I always have a flashlight on me uh, and that should become something that, becomes a habit that all of the listeners adopt as opposed to just when they go out, right? Like there, there's no reason why you shouldn't carry a flashlight every single day. You know, we're not carrying around the giant D cell flashlights of the eighties and the nineties. We're right. carrying, you know, high output, high lumen, high candela flashlights of, of today. So I don't see why people don't prepare ahead of time when things are so practical now. Right. You know, that makes sense. And, and that's why we're talking about this stuff is to hopefully we can, we can talk people into it and get them thinking about man yeah usually when i leave the truck with the dog it's like throw my bag on my back and go and i have like i said i have kind of the bare essentials in there i may not have what i need i think about it like this too so we've we've talked about the boat thing you know obviously you're gonna you're gonna want to have a first aid kit in your boat you're having some extra food in there hot food, hot drinks, obviously PFDs, the ability to survive outside in a big boat. That's pretty easy. I mean, you could literally throw in a bug out box or bag in your boat and it stays there, right? Not going anywhere. A lot of what we do out here, and this, this applies to the upland hunters as well, which being from the Northeast, you probably did a little bit of upland hunting in your life. And I did too, back where I grew up and in, in the mountains out here, man, you get rambling around and you think about it. The next thing you know, you're up this mountain drainage and you followed a, you followed a bunch of chuckers up this hillside, or you're going into this old burn looking for blue grouse or dusky grouse. And you slip, twist a knee up, twist an ankle up, God forbid, break a leg. You're if you're anything like me, a lot of times you're a long ways from your truck and you're probably going to be there at l- for you're either going to crawl out of there. And it's going to take you a really long time to do that or hobble out of there, or you're going to be stuck there waiting. And if you don't have some of the things you need on your person, you could very easily freeze to death in September in the mountains, or like you said, In the Northeast, I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. It gets below freezing most nights of the year, it seems like, outside of winter. What are some things that guys should have in their vest, should have in their backpack? I mean, it gets hot. You're rambling around. You're climbing hills. you got a light shirt on usually. But what what else should we be thinking about that's easy to carry with them? Well, we just filmed this video yesterday for you guys. Um, so I've got it handy. It's a compass. Awesome. Now, I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of <coughs> hunters are going to say, oh, I carry a compass. And they're probably referring to the little button compass. Little that goes on compass. The best. Yeah. Which that's good for general wayfinding. It's good for giving you an idea of like, where's the easterly sky, the westerly sky, am I right. heading south, southwest? But in terms of accuracy, it's, it's not great. Um, I think what's really important for hunters to get in the habit of doing is understanding, all right, I'm walking into the woods in this cardinal direction, this, this general direction. Uh, What is going to be my reverse azimuth? What's going to be my, what's going to be the direction that I'm going to need to walk. If I do get turned around, if I do lose my bearings, 
which way is the nearest way to get to a known point of reference, right? I mean, some people are going to be hunting on preserves where they would know like, okay, our, I'm just going to make up a, a number here, like state route, you know, 47 is to the east, right? If I walk two miles, I know I'll get to that. And I'll swallow my pride and have to walk on the road back to my vehicle or whatever. Right, but right. To, un to understand where you're going and to be able to accurately navigate to a point of safety is absolutely critical um and most people will carry a compass just to satisfy their friends like well i've got a compass it's like okay do you know how to use that compass right uh, and unfortunately many people they they find compasses intimidating because it does involve a little bit of math but quite honestly before their science everything is magic but when you do figure out what that magic is and how to use it and, and realize how many capabilities you have and how accurate you can be with a compass you'll never want to be without one um, and granted, there are some good compasses that you can find on phones and apps and on GPS, but all of those require battery technology. As long as I keep this away from something metal, it's going to be mostly reliable. Uh, so I would say compasses are very important. Um, you know, I always tell people never to leave their home unless they're ready to spend the night in the clothes that they're wearing, and that will solve most of the problems. I mean, you can always build a fire and increase your relative comfort, you know, temperature wise. Um, but you shouldn't leave your home and say like, okay, I'm going to you know, just be, you know, a two minute walk from my car or, you know, I'm going to this location. I don't need all this stuff. Always have the clothes that you're ready to spend the night in. Uh, that'll save you a lot of, a lot of headache and heartache. Uh, you hit the nail on the head with the first aid kit. Um, you know, aside from that, I mean, you can, you have to really balance possibility and probability. Right. It's like, right. It's like, you like, can't oh, carry yeah. everything. You, you, can't. You, you can't do it. I mean, I, I love finding the guys that do because they, they just look awesome. You know, they look they, they look like the cartoon of the guy that is always like trying to compensate for a lack of skill with having everything like Inspector Gadget style. Right. Uh, but it's not, you know, the flip side of the coin is just as foolish, right? You don't want to say, well, you know, the probability of that is not going to happen. So I'm not going to carry anything. You've got to find the, the happy balance of the two. Um I don't think you can simply say, well, I hunt here all the time. So if I got in trouble, I could find my way out. You should always, always think about what's possible, what's probable, what's, you know, what's the, the most practical for what you can carry. Like you're not going to carry the same backpack mountain hunting uh, that you would if you were pheasant hunting and, and vice versa. So that's just, that's just it. You know, I think about my upland hunting has changed dramatically living in the West <clears throat> The big thing being when I, where I grew up, similar to what you did, you, there was no dead reckoning. There was no, there were no landmarks that you could, yeah. I mean, you're looking for like unique trees, basically, <clears throat> or a rock outcropping, but you can't see. And I had some friends that college buddies that I'd take out and they would get lost within a hundred yards. They'd be turned around. They would be veering off instead of holding a line through a cover, we're going to hunt from this road to this river. And then we're going to turn 180 and work up the riverbank back to the, this back to a road. And we'll come back to the truck. And it's, we're going to hunt a couple, maybe a 40 acre or 80 acre piece, right? Follow the dog through there, roughly maintain a line and push through this roughly. And they would always get lost. Well, they were all from out West. They were all from Western States. And I couldn't understand it. How are you getting lost? We're, we're literally going to walk in a straight line through this, but it's thick cover with no landmarks. They can't orient by looking at the skyline. And I did not understand that until I moved to Wyoming. And how honestly, how simple when you have visibility, that's a key thing, how simple it is to be able to pick a mountain or a valley or a drainage hunt up one side back down the other and as long as you can keep your your bearings and your wits about you it's pretty easy i had a i had a scenario a couple of years ago i'd hunted all afternoon hunting grouse up up a drainage and onto a big flat and down off the back side into another drainage so i knew i had to go back over the top right well it got dark on me and i'm coming up out of there no moon it was pitch black. Can't see your hand in front of your face type thing. Had a headlamp. I had, I had a compass, but it wasn't quite the orienteering style compass that you're talking about. 
but I had my phone and I had, um, I had on X on the on X hunt app on my phone. I had my truck marked as a waypoint just cause I thought, you know what? I know this country really, really well. And basically if you walk North, you're going to hit the road, but I'd like to be able to kind of veer towards my pickup, you know, towards so I'll set it as a waypoint. Well, I got up in there and it got dark and I thought, all right, I got to hit, walk up out of this bottom, hit the top of the ridge. And then I got to kind of veer to the right around this old forest burn, this forest fire burn. And then I'll hit the ridge top and be able to navigate down to the pickup. Oh well, yeah. I navigated right. I navigated right back in a circle and I'm walking, it's pitch black and it gets got my headlamp on and I'm looking around and I'm like, this isn't right. This I'm all of a sudden, I. The downhill should be on my left, and all of a sudden it's on my right again. And I'm thinking, I must have just kept walking and veering to the right through all of this timber. And so I got out, got out the the Onyx app, fired it up, looked. I was due south of my rig. And I th- and I was it was a ways, but I'm like, I'm due south of it. All right, head, take your bearing, your southerly bearing, head right at it. I walked for another couple minutes. And I started recognizing, okay, I recognize that down tree. I recognize, okay, oh, there's my trail. There's the game trail I followed up the ridge. Down we went. But I I know that country really, really well. And I still got turned around once it got dark. And if I'd have been up there wandering around or been far enough from my truck, I think it gets to a certain point when you got to bag it in the dark and say, I'm here. I'm staying here because I'm going to get myself in trouble if I'm wandering around. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I always make sure I have in that situation is a jacket or at least a vest of some sort, because I'm busting brush, I'm climbing over, climbing hills. I'm just wearing a light shirt to, and a hunting vest to hunt in, but tucked in the back of that, I've got a puffy or I've got something that's small and compressible. What, what's your go-to? What do you recommend in situations like that? Um, I'm a big believer in if you're going to spend the night in, in the great outdoors, you need to just look at it as it's just camping, right? I'm just going to camp right. for the night, right? It's so easy, right? The So in response to your question, what's my go-to? Positive mental attitude, right? Hey, guess what? I get a night. I love it. I love it. I love it. Like, it's so it's so easy to, to say to yourself, like, oh, my God, everyone is going to make fun of me or, you know, my reputation as this like great white hunter or, you know, whatever you want to call yourself is going to be ruined because I have to spend a night here. It's like, no, it's going to be on your terms, right? You are the one calling the shots. And if that's the case, then it should be a relaxing night, right? Tell yourself in the morning with a fresh set of eyes, you can go back to that last known point uh, of, that you could recognize and you could find your way out rather than pushing through in the dark Worst case scenario, I mean, you could get ledged up, right? You could be put into a location where you can't climb up, can't climb down. You can't get out. Yeah, you can't can't get out, out, right? Wait until morning so you don't do that. Uh, Like you said, have a jacket. I like having gloves with me because as you're feeling around in the dark, your hands are going to be your your lifeline. Uh, Your hands are going to allow you to do a lot of things. So carrying a, a decent set of leather gloves will let you break sticks in the dark, you know, use your hands, not worry about cutting your hands if you're reaching for things potentially grabbing onto to anything sharp like prickers or briars or anything like that. So gloves, a wool hat. Um, but one of the things, my absolute favorite things that I carry when I go hunting, uh, and I usually have it in my backpack, is at Lowe's, the Home Depot, at a lot of like gardening stores, hardware stores, they sell this little green kneeling pad you can put, you can get for like gardening, right? And that tends to be about the size of the North American man's arse. And it fits perfectly, right? So you can take it out of your backpack. You can put it underneath you. Now you're protecting yourself from the cold of the ground, right? Then you just lean your back up against a tree, right? Or, or a rock with your backpack, protecting you from the cold of the rock or the tree. And you sit cross-legged and you just hang out, you know, like you, you maybe get a little bit of sleep. You build a small fire, right? Not the white man fire, which is the giant fire, but just sure. big enough to to, you know, give you a little bit of a understanding of what's around you and, and keeps you company throughout the night. And the smaller the fire that you can maintain, the less firewood you have to gather, right? So I would tend to, to do that. 
and just hang out, right? It's just camping. It's not anything that's going to be an emergency if you're not going to make it one. So you just want to just relax, chill out. You'll go home in the morning. Yeah, your wife or your, I don't know, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever you have at home uh, might be a little annoyed at you, but I have a feeling they'd probably rather be annoyed than be really upset that, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, they, they're going to have to arrange a funeral. You know what my, I mean? my wife and I have a standing under a standing understanding, if you will, that she'll say, well, when, when are you going to be home? And I say, when I'm home, you know, it's one of yeah. those things where it's like, if, if I give her a time <clears throat> and yes, there's times when you're on a timeline, you've only got a couple hours, you go out, you do whatever. But if I don't know, and I'm going to be gone, you know, say it's, it's Saturday and I've got until Sunday before I can be home. I just tell her, look, if I'm not home by Monday, by so late Sunday night or Monday, then you can worry. But if I'm gone, if I'm out overnight, that happens now not necessarily so much hunting upland birds or turkeys or waterfowling, but in, on the big game side of things, good grief. We, I mean, this fall we killed a bull elk and I, we didn't finish the pack out. We killed him right in the evening and we didn't finish the pack out till the sun was coming up the next morning. I didn't get home that night. I didn't get home until the next night by the time we got it all done. Yeah. So I guess having, what I'm saying is having those agreements in place, having those understandings in place are pretty key. Um, one of the things that, what are your thoughts on like communication devices? Okay. So I'm glad you brought that up. I like the idea of having a comms window, right? I like the idea of telling someone, all right, uh, I'm going from Friday to Sunday. If you don't hear back from me Sunday night around eight o'clock, right. Uh, then do what you have to do, right? Call the authorities, reach right. out to my friends who I'm supposed to be with, that type of thing. So a comms window is really important where you tell someone like, okay, I'll have my phone on me from this hour to this hour, try to call me or I'll call you. You have that clear understanding. You know, it's not like you're just calling and leaving a message on an answering machine or a voicemail that won't be checked. Um, but having a, an understanding uh, of a comms window in terms of the different types of technology, cell phones are phenomenal. Two-way radios work great. Uh, Two-way radios with extended antennas are phenomenal. You don't even have to have the civilian band license in order to carry one and use it in an emergency. So as an emergency device alone for $25, $30, you can get you know, a Baofeng radio and you can uh, transmit in an emergency. You want someone to come and find you if, if they're like, hey, you're not supposed to be on this channel. It's like, good, come and arrest me. By the way, I'm up against this tree, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, the Garmin, the Garmin in reach, Garmin in reach is amazing. Uh, I mean, five years ago we were using them and they're still relevant today. Like text messaging. I mean, you can still send a, a very strong message, a signal through, through Garmin in reach. And I think it's like 10 or $12 per it's month. Not, so. It's not expensive. I used one this year. It was new to, new to me. And we played with it a little bit for, um, for the hunting journals It's called Zolio. I believe okay, it's, yeah. I believe yeah. it's a Canadian company. Um, and I put that thing through the, through the paces and I mean, I may as well have been 50 miles into the wilderness someplace because there's no, there's no comms available where I was. We weren't, I wasn't that far into the back country, but you might as well have been on the moon. And I was able to shoot text messages to my wife yeah. via the phone, same way, roughly that the in reach works. And I've used the inReach before. Phenomenal devices, even if it's just, even if it's just you're, you know, you're out and say you're, you're on, you're on the river. Um, I, I can't think of a lot of scenarios where I'm duck or where I'm waterfall hunting where I don't have cell yeah. service. But I can think of a bunch where I'm upland hunting in the mountains out here or in the North Woods where I don't have cell service. And ha being able to shoot a message to someone, to my wife and say, hey, uh, hunting's really good, going to stay an extra day. You know, right. I'm, in a, I'm, in a, I'm sleeping in the camper shell of my pickup or I'm doing whatever and I don't have cell service and I don't feel like driving an hour to get it. You know, those, those places and, and situations still exist. And as hunters, especially, we do find ourselves in those scenarios quite a bit, especially the Upland guys, because it seems like they're in 
in the, in the Northeast and in the Midwest, upper Midwest, they're in heavy cover, um, heavy trees, heavy forest, a, a lot of times quite a ways from, from civilization for crying out loud. My parents live in Northeast Iowa and I don't have cell service at their house. You know, they yeah. live in, they live in a, a, on the edge of a limestone bluff surrounded by trees, just no cell service there. Yeah, um, and I would rec- I'd recommend if you're going to carry one of those devices, carry it on your person, right? Because there even, you go. Just, even just driving to where you're going to be hunting or fishing or whatever you're doing in the great outdoors, it's not going to do you any good if it's in the way back of your vehicle, your vehicle wrecks, and now you've got to send a message, right? So there's no reason not to carry an in-reach in a small jacket pocket. And worst case scenario, your vehicle wrecks, things get thrown everywhere. If it's in a zipper pocket, it's within arm's reach. Right. So, right. No. I mean, right. We say the same thing about bear spray or, or, yeah. a hand, or a handgun in the big game side of things out here. It's like, it doesn't do you any good if it's in your backpack. If you yeah, can't, or the, can't or the bear it. spray, or my favorite is like up in Glacier National Park. A few years ago, we saw plenty of people who were hiking with bear spray on giant backpacks, one person, and it was clipped to the back. Like you couldn't reach back and grab it. Mm-hmm. And the safety was like, it was still in the plastic, like the shrink wrap on the safety. I'm like, man, how many, how many different ways are you going to stack the odds against yourself? You know, like, yeah. yep. just not yeah. smart. Yeah. And I think that is a kind of an overall overarching message is be think stuff through. You know, if you if you take a minute and you think about things beforehand, you can avoid a lot of problems, a lot of disasters. But all right, so let's break down. We've talked about having extra clothes. We've talked about having, you know, if you're an Upland guy, I always I like the puffy jacket because it's compressible. It's easy to carry. The warmth for weight is is massive. I can stick it in the game bag on my on my strap vest. Super simple, right? And, and, and it's going to keep me, it's going to get me through a night if I, if absolutely has to. Um, carrying a poncho or, or something like that. All small stuff that's easy, right? Right. First aid kit. What are we, what do we need in a first aid kit? And I'm thinking, what are we looking at as far as hunters, hunters go? We're dealing with knives. We're dealing with mm-hmm. firearms. We're dealing with treacherous terrain where slip and falls happen, you know, um, what's kind of the basic that we should be looking at and you can obviously build from there. Yeah. So I'll start off with like a first aid kit. I won't get into the trauma just yet. Sure. One of, one of the most common injuries to, to anyone that uses knives, bushcrafters, hunters, fishermen cuts to the fingers, right? Having the dedicated knuckle bandages, right? You can always cut the wings off the knuckle bandages and use them elsewhere, but having the ability to have a knuckle bandage that works around fingers phenomenal right so that's definitely you know one of the the key items antibiotic ointment right to put on anything so you you're not going to worry about anything getting infected while you're out there another great thing to have um there's a whole host of pills that you should carry right ibuprofen would be a great thing for pain uh something that is like benadryl for allergies because you don't know who you're going to be hunting with if if they're going to introduce you to something that you have an allergic reaction to you don't want to call your day just because of that so pain, uh, allergies, anti-diarrhea, right? Uh, if you're in a hunting camp and let's say that you're eating food that wasn't prepared the best way, you don't want to be exploding from both ends. So I would say those. And if you can get like a good broadband antibiotic, that'll be great. Um, maybe save it from the last time you get sick, you know, sure. talk to your sure. doctor so you can get those. So those would be like the four pills. You don't have to go overboard. Um, in a hunting camp, depending on if you have a stove, right? Like if you're making hot coffee, carry some type of a small little container of burn cream. You'll have burns to the fingertips, right? Burns to the hands. Those do happen. Um, eye injuries. Now here's something that. Oh man, maybe, I've got, I've got a story about this. So after you're I, done. Yeah. So, so one of my, one of my good friends, former student, uh, you know, optometrist, he said that you can ask your eye doctor for uh, ophthalmolic antibiotic ointment. Hmm. Now here's the, here's the key. You can use that on your eyes, right? If you cut your cornea, I cut my cornea 10 years ago. And to this day, when I'm really dehydrated, I can still feel my eyelid catching on the scar. It's really no unpleasant. kidding. Wow. Yeah, it's bad news, but you can also use that, that antibiotic eye ointment anywhere else on your body. You, ah. can, you cannot do it the other way around. You can't just go and get. <laughs> so you know, don't don't stick neosporin in your eye. 
yeah, not, not advised. Right. Uh, and that's, that's a general rule. Like with a lot of these products that are meant for like, uh, like, uh, any injuries to the mouth, if there's something that you can put in your mouth, you can put it on the external you know, side of your body as well. So I would say those are like the, the key things. I, if you're going to carry one size gauze, carry larger gauze pads. Again, you can cut them down to size. Sure. Um, tape isn't a bad thing to have in case you're dealing with, with blisters or anything like that, especially if you don't have time to break in a set of hunting boots or any of your kit and you feel a hot spot, you can always build up a, a layer on blisters, right? definitely tweezers for removing briars, ticks. Um, you know, just talking to a buddy today who, because of, listen to this one, this one freaks me out because of the Lyme disease that he contracted, he found the only way that he could effectively overcome Lyme disease was with a diet change and he had to become vegan. Now, oh. I know I was oh, like, Oh man, like, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'd fight through that. I don't want, I don't want to give up, uh, <laughs> <laughs> give up any of that good stuff that kind of but defeats would, the purpose of hunting even holy smokes right right so so yeah those are the, those are the basics right for like a, a basic you know small pocket kit and it's not going to take up too much space um you know you don't necessarily need to carry an extra flashlight or trauma shears or anything like that if you have scissors on your swiss army knife it'll cut gauze just as well um but then in terms of like true emergency like oh my gosh this is a trauma traumatic event carry a tourniquet right? You can carry a tourniquet because you don't know all of your hunting buddies, the capabilities of firearms, accidents do happen, right? Oh, absolutely. Massive, massive blood loss, right? So carry a tourniquet, um, quick clot, you know, the, the powder that what they call cat crap now, or, or kitty litter, uh, it's been replaced by hemostatic gauze and right. hemostatic gauze right. is great for like deep injuries that you can pack and, and get pressure against. Um, an Israeli bandage can be used in multiple ways. I mean, Again, we're trying to not make this pack too large, but the a basic first aid kit will fit, you know, in a small container and it's very easy to pack. There's no reason you shouldn't have it. You know, when I'm thinking of what you're saying, I'm thinking like a basic first aid kit in your blind bag that you're that you have with you in the field. Um or in that fits in your in your hunting vest. If you're if you're a bird hunter, you're probably wearing some kind of a vest. If you're a waterfowler, you're probably having a, you probably have a backpack or um, some sort of a, of a blind bag, some sort of a possible bag that a, a small kit would fit in there for what you're talking about. Having a larger, more comprehensive kit in your vehicle or in your boat, um, maybe both, because I'm thinking, okay, if something were to happen and the tourniquet might not be a bad idea to have in on your person and not just have it, but like we talked about the bear spray knowing how to use it the right way because a Correct. lot of people think they get it tight enough and it's not it's not doing its job so taking a taking a class learning how to use that how to use that is would be important and i can see having that on your person and then having you know maybe a couple of quick clock quick clock pads kind of some of that stuff that fits with your person and then having a, a larger more comprehensive kit that you can get back to Man, you talk about the cornea cut, um, was on a pheasant hunt years back in South Dakota, and we were pushing through standing corn and buddy should have been, granted should have been wearing glasses, wasn't, and took a corn leaf across the eye oh. and it sliced his eye. Not the skin, not the outside of the eye. The eyeball itself sliced, I don't know how many layers, but laid it wide open. And we, it was like emergency room type thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing they can do. He's got to go and find an optical surgeon to fix that. And it was basically just keeping him comfortable. But none of us had the right stuff. You know, it was like, you're just going to have to tough it out, buddy, until we drive you two hours to the, to the, to the ER. And then they're going to drug you up and we're going to put you in a vehicle and take you 12 hours home, you know, brutal. Yeah, and, and in those cases, normally you'd want to get like an eye cup that would go right. over the top. But if you don't have that, here's a, a quick and dirty solution. Even a Dixie cup, right? Mm. Like a paper Dixie cup, right. you can cut it, cut the, 
the bottom off, right? So you're not looking to hold anything in it. You're cutting the top ring off and you can put that there and that'll keep a little bit of the pressure off of, right. off the eye. Um, but it's, it's, it's nasty. I mean, I did three of five layers and Oof. it was one more layer in, uh, my optometrist was like, yeah, you, you probably would have, you probably would have had uh, partial vision loss. Oh, and the man. worst case, the worst case was, was that I had to wear an eye patch for two days until my eye healed itself. And then for six months on a daily basis, I had to twice a day put antibiotic drops in my eye. Now, if you think about it, that was half a year of daily routine twice a day for something that I could have avoided just by having a pair of safety glasses on yep. as I was using a machete while filming some, some content for the History Channel. So if I just put a pair of glasses on, it would have been all over. But no, no my dumb ass, my dumb ass, I, I didn't. And uh, <laughs> we all so, do it though. We all do it. Yeah. We we are all guilty of like, ah, we're good. I was watching uh, Life Below Zero with my little girls the other day. They love that show. And uh, dude's running a chainsaw with no eye protection, no hearing protection, no nothing. And I'm going, I remember doing that when I was young and stupid, but I'm thinking, I've caught too much stuff in the eye. I've, I've lost enough of my hearing over the years that I'm very cautious about preserving what I have. And honestly, once you get used to wearing that stuff, it, you feel, I feel naked without it, whether I'm yes. hunting, whether I'm running a chainsaw, whether I'm doing gardening work, you know, whatever lawn work, it seems like I've always got that stuff on. I've even gotten to the point, Kevin, where I got, I guide fly fishing in the summer. And I have two sets of glasses. My sunglasses are always, 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 always on my face. But then a lot of times we tri trips go into low light scenarios. And so I've gotten where I, I buy a pair of my yellow shooting glasses that maximize light. Those when the sunglasses come off, those go on because I'm not taking a, I'm not taking a, a fly, a hoof, the shook to the eyeball. I've, I've spent four grand getting these babies fixed. So I have 2010, I have 2010 vision. I'm not sacrificing that. <laughs> no, that is, that is phenomenal. I, I think that if you're listening to this, you should by now be thinking about what, what you can do to maximize your ability to respond in the field and in, in field scenarios and your ability to prevent. Kevin, you said it perfectly. I think balancing what is probable with what's possible because you can't you can't prepare for everything, but you can be prepared enough. It's being prepared enough is being better than not being prepared at all. And I think back to some of the stuff that I did in my younger years where you know you're you're invincible in your 20s. Uh -huh. And it's there are situations that if they'd happen to me now, I don't know if I'm tough enough to get through it, you know, but it's like, I was never prepared and I'm not, I know I'm not alone. Hunters are terrible when it comes to that stuff. And especially waterfowl and upland guys don't necessarily think that, man, I might have to stay the night out here. I might have to, you know, I think about these public land guys that are hiking in long distances to duck hunt in, in places you, know, you step in a in a hole in the dark and you break a leg if you're by yourself you may or may not get found you know right. just because just because there's other guys out there running around doesn't mean they're going to stumble upon the little tiny area that you're in you know and yes you got a gun so you can signal or you, you may have a dog that you know whatever but i think just thinking about those things and being your own first responder is huge yeah, that's one of the, one of our one of our expressions that we always use at Fieldcraft. You are your own first responder. So you, I mean, you nailed it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, dude, I can't say thank you enough for being on with me, and I'd like to have you back on. Let's get some time in the in the field in in Utah, and let's talk hunting the next time you get on and and see to have a have a go again at this again in a little while and and uh, maybe talk something even more specific we'll kind of put our heads together and see what we can come up with but i sure appreciate your time and i appreciate you sharing some knowledge with us and he, like i said i hope i hope that my hope is that people listening to this can have a takeaway where 
next fall, even going turkey hunting this spring, they're more they're more well prepared. More yeah, well my prepared. Uh, my my kind of partner in crime at Fieldcraft and doing all this stuff for Eastman's is uh, is Austin Lester. And Austin's a former Air Force guy. He grew up in North Carolina. He's a, he's a good old boy. He's done a bunch of hunting, fishing, and all that great stuff. But one thing that might be really unique for your listeners, uh, and they should probably start sending you some questions ahead of time for this, because he could jump on the next podcast for certain, uh, is ask him questions about search and rescue, because he recently got tapped to be search oh. and rescue for us out here in Utah. That would and be cool. He, and he always talks about people that go out unprepared, right? And that's the common element of why he's getting called out on snow machines, why he's getting called out to do lifts with helicopters to get people out of the backcountry. So he's got a lot of really unique experiences with that background. Uh, he also is a medic, right? He spent many years uh, in the military and civilian world as, as a medic uh, and brings a, a different perspective than I bring, but together we're complimentary. And I think you your listeners would value from hearing from as well. Well, I so tell you what we'll I'll do. Get them on the post. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think we shoot for that in the, in sometime in the future, maybe going into next fall would be a good time to revisit some of that stuff in, in August. And I'll, yeah, we'll have a little, maybe do a social media post and get some comments generated, some questions. I think that would be a great idea. He actually had the opportunity to come out and do an elk hunt last fall with the guys got to hang out they kind of had to punt a little bit and it worked but it worked out and he got to spend several days on the big game side of things with with us i wasn't part of that um yeah neither was i i'm kind of jealous by the nah, way so. well maybe maybe there could be another opportunity in the future that would be pretty cool yeah. but well thank you kevin i really appreciate your time man and i'm gonna go ahead Anytime. and stop recording <laughs>